who in, in during the time of the struggle, the non-white people who, who fought against apartheid were seen as black. We, the black people, or the people of color. After 1994, we became Indians again. Welcome to the Global Indian Podcast, the world's greatest journey and the official platform for people of Indian origin. Because let's face it, we are everywhere. Welcome back to The Voyage. This is Season 1, Episode 8, Made in South Africa. My name is Rajan Nazran and I explore. For over a decade I have traveled the world, piecing together the kaleidoscope that is our community. I have been held hostage, faced Ebola and met extraordinary individuals, often in destinations that would surprise you. In this season, I'm joined by my dear friend, screenwriter, actor, and social heart, Kulvinda Gear, and together we're taking you on a voyage for the ears as we plunge into the human experience of being a person of Indian origin and take a closer look at the countries we now call home. This episode is an ode to the power of expression. You will meet the global Indian who, besides being a renowned actor, writer, and producer, is also a unique social activist. We will look into the real dynamics of living in post-apartheid South Africa and gain a deeper understanding of what's it like for him and the global experience of being Indian in the country. This is a very, very candid conversation and given recent events in America, it fans the flames of positive discussion on the injustice in the modern world. I have no doubt it will make you relook at the country and understand more about the often overlooked contribution of the global Indian community towards this unique region. Welcome to a conversation with an incredible individual, a good friend and also a global Indian ambassador, Rajesh Gopi. You can find out more about the Global Indian series at the end of the podcast. I sincerely hope you enjoy this session. And just move. Get up and just move. Get up and just move. Get up and just move. Get up. So, Rajesh, what's it like being you? <laughs> uh, yeah. Ask my ex-girlfriend. Uh, <laughs> I think being me um, encompasses, um, you know, let's use a, a let's use an Indian analogy, kind of a parata, many layers, you know, but uh, many layers of, of 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 being of Indian origin, yet being um, born in Africa. Um, speaks English as the first language with speckling of Zulu, speckling of Hindi, um, probably most fluent other than English in Afrikaans, which is the oppressor's language. Um, but I'm fluent in it, funny enough. I even act in Afrikaans films. Um, so uh, I, I'm of the West, I'm of the East. Um, so what is it being me? It's being a... A, a, a multitudinous in a single kind of person uh, living in the southern tip of Africa. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess uh, a term such as Afro-Indian or Afrasian may apply to me. Um, in some case, you know, I'm coolitude, you know? Yeah. Um, of of that, and uh, I'm not afraid of that term. It's become in the politically correct uh, world where there's a lot of uh, facetious ideas around what can and can't be said. You, if even you mention the word coolie, they say, oh my God, how can? But it's true. That was an official name given to Indians. Yeah, words suddenly have so much power. Disarm them. They have no power. Yeah. So yeah. So who am I? I'm a person who who is a, a a kind of a arts artist an arts activist in my soul um, who expresses it through writing and performance and 
it's hard not to to think like an artist, not just uh, an actor, but an artist is someone who thinks or she thinks very deeply. I think very deeply about things. Yeah. I have intuition about things. I speak loudly about injustice and I scream when I need to. Because, um, you know, diplomacy is for the politicians. Uh, and I am I'm an artist. I, I, but what I find increasingly, being me, like many you know, artists have become more and more quiet in silence. Yeah. It's a right-wing world um, where we, where if you cut out, if you cut the throat of funding, you also cut out the voice of the artist. If you cut out the, the access to the venues, the theaters, you also cut out the artist. Um, you know, denigrated to some kind of social media activist, which is dime a dozen. So space is power. Uh, and I'm that person living in that space. Well, not others like me. I'm, you know, and in in within the Indian community, I um, you know, there are a few voices in the art scene. I'm I'm very vocal, um, and you know, you if some silly person once said, arts has nothing to do with politics and vice versa. I said, you are a fool. Yeah, I said you're a fool. Even the food you eat is about politics. You know, it's an it's an the most absurd ignorance that you are articulating here. Yeah. And of course that led to a, a disagreement, but that's the kind of thing, is that everything is politics. Politics is the business of people and what we get up to. Absolutely. In, well, yeah. Well I was gonna say as a business of people, one thing that you're very much strongly on is the custodian of justice and truthfulness. What are the biggest injustices that you see in South Africa as an individual, as a person of Indian origin? Because I know I was doing some research. I had a look at the Indanda riots. I saw videos. Indanda. Indanda riots. Yeah. Um, I saw the video from a gentleman called Julius Malemba turning mm -hmm. around. And that's a recent video. This isn't going back mm -hmm. too far mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. And some well, of these things are quite shocking. Yeah, so there are a few injustices <laughs> that, uh, um, you know, one could say I'm self-appointed, but we artists are self-appointed, aren't we? Not funded by anybody. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, there is that element of African nationalism, exclu exclusionism around Africanism. Uh, very simply, we have a saying here, in the old days, we, used, we weren't white enough. Now we're not black enough. <laughs> and um, in, in, during the time of the struggle, the non-white people who, who fought against apartheid were seen as black. We, the black people, or the people of color. After 1994, we became Indians again. And it was classified that we are Indian and we belong in a certain category, uh, a certain category in terms of how we will be viewed in jobs in affirmative action and BE, etc. Uh, and for me, this was an injustice because mm -hmm. we had that opportunity of integrating ourselves. And you know, even if you use we the people of color, I wouldn't have mind. Even if they use we Afrasians, it would have been lovely to be part. Of it. I'm an Afrasian, you know, he's, an, he's, a, he's, a, he's a black African, I'm an Afrasian. It would have been really nice to be part of a, a dialogue where Africa was part of my ethnicity in that yeah. sense. Um, but that's not the dialogue. The dialogue is around exclusionism. Um, I, think I, I, think, I think I gave you this analogy. It's like this. So democracy, uh, when we spoke last, democracy is about everybody's allowed into the nightclub. Yeah. And... Um, Initially, when the doors of the nightclub opened and we all came in and we all wanted to dance, they said, no, 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 hold on, hold on. You people, you Indian people, and uh, because now you're Indian, and you colored people, you mixed people, go sit at the bar and buy yourself a drink. Uh, we white people are going to dance with the black people now because, you know, they are our favorite dance partners right now. And so they danced. And, um, and then, you know, you said, hey, you know, if you complain, they say, well, why are you complaining? Aren't you in the nightclub? Yeah, but you're not allowed, allowed to dance, are you? You know, <laughs> and you go buy your own drinks, isn't it? Yeah. And and over time, even that changed. Now the black people just want to dance with themselves, and everybody else is sitting at the bar. You know, 
And uh, so that's how it feels like some of the injustices. One of the other injustices is the issue around poverty and the issue around um, the dream, the dream of Mandela, the dream of inclusionism. Um, this is problematic for me because that's, uh, maybe it was a naive dream at the time because everyone wasn't the same. And you know, white people were definitely on top and they still had money and they still had land and they still do. But um, this goes beyond just being Indian. This goes to see people, mo majority of black people whose lives have not improved at all. And what has improved are the lives of uh, bureaucrats, the lives of the corrupt, yeah. the lives of, um, of politicians um, who, who, who play these people uh, like you would play ping pong, you know, across the table. Um, which comes to the other thing when you mention this Julius Malema character. I mean, he's a he's fascist. I mean, that's the only way to 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 uh, describe him, and that's the only way he knows that he to 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 rise to power. Popularism, uh, um, you know, kind of a guru-driven type of political personality, and most most importantly, speaking and citing at the base base denominator. Yeah. Using race, using, um, I mean, he, 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 he's a, he's a, he only knows what, all he knows to do is to be popular. So, um, and, 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 and everything about him, if you, if you follow him, is about saying the most controversial, taking the most opportunity, uh, presenting himself as a, as a, um, uh, or for the poor, yet they're drinking the most expensive champagne. They arrive in Gucci suits and fancy cars, then go into a room in Parliament and put on red suits, like working overalls. The red work over, and then go into Parliament in a workers' overall. The entire party we're using red berets. It's a show. It's it's a pantomime. Yeah, and they like children. They will oppose everything. They disrupt. They get thrown out. Everything to draw media attention to them. And as long as they're doing, as long as the media covers them, that's they're relevant. exactly how, they're relevant, and that's how they uh, they get power. People, you know, some guy, oh yeah, yeah, look, he he stood up to so and so. We like that because, you know, to the most disenfranchised, physical power or physical abuse of somebody in power is gratifying. So it's the base base uh, behavioral pattern that this popularist fascist but has and, it has, and they and they are as corrupt as anything i can well has it translated into much more than just words because turning around on stage saying indians are racist and that's the same yeah. what he said and he's, he's and that's he's, one he's, of many quotes from this guy yeah yeah listen let's just get one thing straight indians like all people have racism in them if if you if you were to tell me there's you know, racism doesn't exist, that we don't actually harbor that as part of our genetic makeup to some extent, then I think you have not been entirely honest. And um, there is difference. We feel difference. But it is our shared humanity that overcomes that biological, it's, I almost feel biological difference. So I'm going to... Absolutely. A, yeah. So it's, it would not be fair to say that Indians are not racist. They are as racist as the next man or woman of another group. but but um, this does not mean uh, that we have not integrated. This does not mean that we do not care. It does not mean that we do not share common, many, many common avenues. And in many cases, it doesn't matter what, what, what your race is. We work together. We, 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 people even marry each other, you know, so... Mm. I don't think it's too blanket to say racism. There's many, many ways of coming into the into this thing. So yes, there have been there have been you know issues around that, but to single out a minority for that is um, is unfair. Yeah. And 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 to use that because what he's doing is it's a scare tactic. It's a it's a it's 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a common tactic that he uses. Um, and what do you do? You start putting. Um, a, 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 you start inciting unemployed people. You start inciting disenfranchised people to hate the easy target. The and has that owner. happened? Has that yeah. hate begun in any way? Yeah, 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 yeah. 
absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, he's just articulating, I mean, look, if he was articulating something that he, only he himself espoused, um, um, then it wouldn't, uh, people would say, what the hell are you talking about, Julius? Man? You're talking rubbish. But yeah. he's speaking to a congregation that is saying, yeah. You Rajesh, know, yeah. Can, can I ask you a personal question, if yeah. I may? Um, have you seen discrimination against yourself or in South Africa? I know it sounds like a very absurd question to ask, but have you noticed any form of discrimination there? Because I remember on the phone you mentioned about this new economic empowerment program where you have a doctor who can go in from a certain type of ethnic background. Rather than me push it forward, why don't you allow our listeners to hear that side of the yeah. question? So it's a funny thing because, you know, what I perceive as racism, one would say, uh, no, it's actually a government um, policy, you know, for the best of, of, of who, okay? So, um, for example, um, a black kid is, al is allowed to enter the medical profession uh, through, the, 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 through the medical college and there are very, very few medical colleges in the country. And these colleges are run by the government. They're not private. So they're no private, no private licenses. This is interesting. No private license for medical colleges. So if you want to study medicine in South Africa, it has to be a government college. And it with very strict quota systems. And to address the past of there not being enough black doctors, which I understand, um, over the last 20 odd years, it's been, you know, um, allowing black students to come in. And um, there are exceptional black students to make this clear and who are on par with everybody else, the best yeah. of the best. But a lot of them will get in on four C's, but an Indian student or a white student with seven A's, 80% uh, plus may not get in. So it's not based on social standing, it's more based on. It seems based on race. Education. Yeah, it's based on race. And so hypothetically, if you're a black African student that went to private school and you got three C's, you'll still get in. That's just the funny thing. It is. So you could be a rich father, the father of the son, daughter of the president with four C's, but you'll get in because you are disadvantaged. The blanket disadvantaged notion is is the problem. Um but I mean, that's one of the many things, um, you know, uh, for me, being me, coming back to that question, being me, it's like, what is nationalism? What is patriotism? And, you know, I said nationalism is the worst form of patriotism um, because it, 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 it means that you are, if you're not with the masses or whatever that swing is or movement is, you're against it. And if you speak out, you can get, especially now, you know, in the old days, you wrote a letter to the newspaper, people read it and they thought about it and they, maybe one person would write back or two people would write back. But now with social media is that people start, any Tom, Dick and idiot out there will become abusive. And yeah. there's something, you know, uh, people like um, this Malema chap have what we call the Twitter brigade, you know, the Twitter, the, the, <laughs> they, they call them the, um, uh, yeah, the Twitter brigade, and you know they they they'll send their people to pulverize you there, you know. I, and I so if you say anything, if you see anything, they will they will they will attack you. It's like a matrix. You know the Matrix film where those <laughs> funny creatures come and attack you. It's exactly yeah. what they will do. So they are, you know, they are extremely vicious and extremely clever at at that. So any dissidents around their identity or who they are. I mean, these, are, these guys are thugs. They has, thugs has, have you been impacted by that? Because I think rather than skirting around the subject, there was an infamous message that you posted. And I think knowing you, I don't think you had any malice bone in your body, but it seemed to have been taken out of context massively. Do you think that yeah. that was no, part of this I, matrix? I <laughs> I, I think that matrix uh, was very interesting because it, it did split people. Um, there were a lot of people who, of course, that's not in the newspapers, who actually came out, including lots and lots of black people, who said, actually, that's not racist at all. And um, 
and that they did people did behave very badly. There's one thing um, about being overtly racist, and there's another thing about there's, an, uh, there's another thing if you say something that can be construed as racist. Absolutely. So there's, there's a difference. There's a, there's a there's a distinguished should be distinguished. Um, as reported, a, a woman was murdered in the middle of a stadium by a rampaging mob of you know, God knows what you want to call them. And um, my, and, and they attack anyone and everyone, including the football players who had to run for their lives. Wow. But the video showed, I mean, if you ever saw the video, I hope you do get to watch it. And was reported a woman steward had run, had tried to avoid the mob, but somehow got cornered in the middle of the football pitch and was assaulted by the mob with, with in, in every vicious way. Yeah. And, and it looked like the person had died and was reported the person had died. Of course, in the moment, that's what we were seeing. And I responded to that, the behavior of these people. But, but uh, and maybe I should not have, maybe I should have been wiser. I am wiser for it. Because you know people will take it um, and use it. Firstly, I'm an actor. Um, you know, and a well-known one. And secondly, I'm Indian. So it, hey, it just made the news. It's the perfect recipe <laughs> for news, for sensationalism. Yeah, they rampaged uh, in, in the media for a while, for a few days. Um, but I don't think in that particular instance, I suffered anything directly from the EFF, which is the thing, you know, I, I, I think for once they thought it wasn't, I mean, it, the, the violence and the, the perpetration of the crime uh, surely uh, yeah. anyone looking at it will see it for what it is. And, you know, uh, somebody... <laughs> it's it's um, hooliganism. It doesn't have a race. It doesn't have an ethnic. No, it's, it, it doesn't yeah. discriminate. It's exactly. Just, more yeah. so, more so. It's, 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 you know, hool hooliganism is when people have a fight and they beat each other up and then they, two mobs go away. But when 30 to 40 people attack, inverted commas, a woman, and but anyway, it turned out not to be a woman, but yeah. it was reported as a woman. A poor steward that is just probably earning like 200 bucks just to be a steward on the day of the football game, to attack them in the middle of the stadium, destroy the television cameras worth millions. And to do that act of cowardice. Yeah. You know, and then for somebody to sit back and say, oh, you are this. No, I'll tell you what I am. I'll tell you what I am. I'm someone who cares. Yeah. I'm someone who cares about my country. I'm someone who cares about women and everyday women are murdered and brutalized in this country on every level. I'm yeah. a person who cares about the image of my country. And maybe I'm just was a bit foolish for, for speaking out in that fashion. Well, we're talking I, about the image of the country, like a lot of the things that you mentioned, and even in your one of the plays that you had, it was looking at this in the riots that took place. We don't hmm. hear about this outside of like in the international realms whether you're sitting in the Caribbean as the Indian diaspora there, or you're sitting in India or even here in London, what parts of South Africa do, are we not aware of? Um, and, and more importantly, what was this riot? Because this is only, it wasn't too long ago either. No. So first of all, it's worthy to mention that there are 1.2 million Indians living in South Africa. This is not wow. a pocket of 100,000 or 200,000. Uh, it's 1.2 million. We were the largest, largest Indian um, diaspora outside India or in, in the world. Uh, but I think now we've been overtaken by the USA and the NRIs. I think there are over 3 million now there because yeah. of, and they, they NRIs. Let me just, <laughs> again. Um, but in terms of the indentured communities, prior to this NRI term, we were the largest in the world. Uh, so that's the first thing you should know. So we mm. play a very significant part, well, maybe in my mind, um, but we play, played a very significant, significant part in the history of this country from the time we've Absolutely. arrived. Absolutely. Let's and, just and how it, long ago uh, was this? Sorry, the quick question. How long ago has the community arrived into South Africa? Because you won the arrived, as well, aren't you? Yeah, we arrived in 1860 as the first batch from 1860 onwards. And wow. indentured labor terminated in 1911. In that period, you may notice a very, not that famous gentleman, but the name of Mr. Mahatma Gandhi, yeah. M.K. Gandhi, 
arrived as a lawyer on his first job here in South Africa, Durban. And it is here that the Mahatma was molded. So Mandela f famously said, you gave us Gandhi the man, we gave you Gandhi the Mahatma. Yeah. So the struggle and politics of this land in many ways shaped the world in many ways. Absolutely. So, and it is the Indian experience here. It may be um, in, in, in sort of in, in Gandhi being the kind of the, what's the word, the icing on the cake about it, but he was learning a lot of things from the indentured laborers, their individual battles, their struggles, people that were standing up, people that were fighting back and, and, and trying to use the law. And this is something that he, he, he certainly was able to see. He saw something in the resilience of the people that were here off from India and they trying to make a home here. Back yeah. Um, that, that must be mentioned that that is South Africa. That is Durban. Uh, the Gandhi of Durban is the Gandhi that went on to liberate India. You yeah. Know? Um, and I have no doubt he took with him the lessons from here. Um, what else is there to know about this is that the, the, the Indian people here have, since the time of Gandhi, been, been in the resistance against first the British, then the Afrikaners and apartheid, fought on the side of the liberation struggle. Um, many Indians did, significant people, you know, men and women, educated and uneducated, you know, brought themselves to the forefront along with their black and colored compatriots, people like Fatima Mir, people, people like Dr. Dadu, you know, many, many, many people. Um, and even today there are struggle um, veterans who are still in the party, the, the African National Congress, are in government, are in, so Indians are in every facet of this society. We are not many, but we are, you're there. That once we're there, in, in, and one spark plug less, that one spark plug we represent takes the power out of it. That's what I believe. But more specifically, you want to talk about these issues of, of riots, and you, you know, racial baiting has always been part of this nation from the beginning of time. First, the people that used to people this land were the sand people, what we call the Khoisan, commonly known as the Bushmen. They were murdered in, you know, a genocide against them by the Nguni tribes that wandered down from central Congo. These Nguni tribes were modern day Zulus, Kosas, people like that. Mm. So they decimated one group of people. Then came the white man, the, 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 the Dutch, the French, the British, and their history decimated the black man and subjugated him. In that period, we Indians arrived as part of the colonial era to work, to provide labor, to provide subservient labor, to provide controllable labor. And um, we, in this servitude, became part of the nation. Um, but there's a very strong strand that is Indian that somehow does not allow itself to be subsumed by others. In some cases, it subsumes others, but itself does not get subsumed. Yeah. This is seen in the Trinidad, it's seen in the, in the West Indies. It's very hard for Indians to get lost in someone else's culture, it seems to me. Yeah. And somehow, they always, always maintain this. And it may bring with it sometimes a false sense of superiority. Mm. which can then be translated as a racist notion. I don't know. It's a complex argument. Yeah. Um, but what's happened is like you go back, there are many incidents, minor incidents of, of murders. Uh, well, I wouldn't call a murder a minor incident, but in terms of scale, I would say minor because many, many murders have occurred where Indians have been targeted, you know, thousands over the period of time, oh, over wow. the last you know, probably the last 50 odd years, because, you know, um, it's, I don't, you know, that's- When you mean Indians old. have been targeted, is that 
blanket targeting of people of Indian origin or is it specific Indians because of X, Y, and Z? I think Indians can be seen as soft targets, generally not wanting to, you know, kind of um, be militant. So, it, it, you know, I've even had, you know, black friends who said, yeah, well, you know, people know that Indians don't like to, you know, get into, into violence generally. And so they, you know, they become soft targets of criminals, etc. I don't think, I don't think, I'm not saying it's a, it's a, it's, 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 it was a racially motivated movement, but a criminal somehow thinks that that can, can happen. It's an easy target. Of course, Indians seem to have savings or wealth or gold in the house, or they have nice things. You know, you can't, you can't then disassociate wealth and the ethnicity of the person yeah. and say it's just a random crime. Um, let's just talk about something more, um, uh, orchestrated. The first uh, known uh, recorded riot of any significance uh, was in 1948. I mean, 1949, actually, when um, it started on a Friday, Friday afternoon, no, was it, yeah, Friday morning, Friday morning, where the, 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 the there are several different uh, versions of it, but a story goes that a a, a, a barrel boy um, in the market. Uh, you know, the, the, the Zulu boys used to be barrel boys of, of, of shifting uh, the things around, you know, in the market. Was uh, a young barrel boy was assaulted or slapped by an Indian uh, stall owner. Um, and this quickly escalated into uh, an angry mob, you know, mm. but then that mob uh, turns its attention, yeah, to the Indian businesses and, and you know, the Indian stalls, but moves into the closest Indian area on the edge of the city called Cato Manor. And most of the men were at work being a Friday, and most of the women and children being at home. This mob um, murdered, burnt, and raped at will. Um, my uh, my grandmother was uh, a little girl. She was, you know, uh, no, she wasn't a little girl. Sorry, she was a young woman. My grandmother, actually, yeah, it was 1949, and um, she she and her. Uh, some of her siblings ran for their lives. She tells a story of how they literally could see the mob coming, and luckily for them, they lived up a, a kind of a kind of a hill, and through the back of the bushes, they just fled, 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 fled onto a main road, crossed over, and then sort of made off into the white area, looking to to be saved. Many, many people, unsuspecting, did not. Many women were raped, many people were killed. Um, and interesting enough, this was an opportunity. You see, I, I, it's hard to say it was just one cause that a barrel boy being slapped was enough yeah. to incite such a massive. And so it has come and has been historically proven that the area of Cato Manor was an eyesore to the white people wanting to um, create a barrier between them in anyone else on the Biria Ridge. At Cato Manor, it's just on the other side of the ridge. And we know that the English people in Libya, the white people, hated Indians on one level, their success, their ability. They just wanted them out of there and we moved them into the township. And interesting, the, the township of Chatsworth, an all Indian township, was already started construction prior to this, to this um, uh, ride. And white garages, started to give petrol and paraffin to these rioters. Um, eventually, so what happened is, this is interesting. My, one of my, my grandfather's cousins told me the story. He said he was working in a factory. Yeah. He was a young boy. He was in his first job. And so they heard, like by after lunch, already this has been going on for a few hours. After lunch, they heard there were rides down by the market and for their safeties, they were going to be locked in. 
so that, you know, until, so they thought, oh, okay, fine. Little did they know that back in Kaja Manor, many of their families and women were being raped and, 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 and um, this was happening. Um, it, it, you know, you can blame white people for inciting and maybe jumping on the wagon, uh, on, on, the, on the wagon of uh, this opportunity. But as a, as a person, as a human being, even if, is that those responsible never had to answer for it. Those who actually perpetrated it. That was, in, that was in 1949 though. So 1949. that means the legal system then wouldn't be in as robust yeah. as it would be now, one would hope. Yeah, yeah. So in 1949, so what happened eventually when the men came home and they, my God, what the hell, then they started to mobilize. Some of them had guns, they started to uh, yeah. arm themselves and they retaliated. You know, they were able to, you know, they too, you know, did some damage, but to try and protect, but then the damage had been done. Yeah. Was the, the old, the infirm and the women were the target of this and this brutality and um, it's funny enough, apparently somebody got killed, one, one, a person, one of the persons got killed, they discovered was actually a white man who had put black polish on his face. And, uh, you know, this is the, the, the stories, you know, they, yeah. I don't know who the person was or whatever, but many saw this as an opportunity to, to, to act this out. And it served the apartheid government that was emerging after 1948 to say, look, people of color can't live together. And there's your there's your reason, yeah. But that's that's like saying it's such a facetious kind of thing to say. Oh well, children, because you all fought, uh, we can't allow you all to play it together anymore. So let's yeah. tell you what, you Indians, you have that playground there, and uh, twenty kilometers between you and that playground, we'll put one for the blacks over there. Yeah. Right. The difference is the black one won't have grass on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Has has anything happened more recently? like that right yeah so um 1985 okay inanda 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 is an interesting place because that's where gandhi had his ashram that's where gandhi lived in durban that's where he set up that's where satyagraha started yeah in the world well actually not no no that's not true you see tolstoy was the one that first spoke about non-violence um, <laughs> Uh, you know, he did. Yeah, you know that, right? Yeah. And Gandhi was a big fan of Tolstoy. That's why he called his farm in Johannesburg Tolstoy Farm. Wow, okay. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, Nanda. And Nanda was, you know, from the days Indians arrived, they lived there. They, they, they were there. In 1985, I was a boy of about, hmm, 1985, I was, I was 13 years old. And then we heard about the riot, a riot that was happening. Indians were being attacked by blacks um, again. So, and we had family there. My mother had cousins. My mother, you know, spent a little bit of a youth there. So we had family there and, and black people, um, who they were, we don't know. Many, we talk about the third force in this country, you know, attacked Indians, drove them out. A few people were killed. Houses were, you know, things were done, rapings, lootings. Of course, you know, people won't come and talk about it in those days. A woman's unlikely to go and make a name for herself saying, well, I've been raped, you know. Yeah. These kind of sufferings get, um, it's like a bitter pill you swallow and live with and try, hope to forget. Mm. You know, and this is the plight of the minority. You, your first instinct is to try and survive the onslaught of, of, of a majority. This is the thing, uh, the people that you're speaking to in the diaspora is that maybe in the islands or the smaller places, you become 50% of a majority. But a lot of the time you are a small community. And if you, right now, 1.2 million versus 50 million black people is, you are definitely a minority. We, we're the largest minority here. Yeah. So, you know, you kind of swallow the pill and you, you carry on. 
um, we made and we continue to make a, a concerted effort to be integrated and, and become peoples of this nation. But coming back to me specifically and what I believe, it's a struggle for me to be uh, completely in love with my nation because of laws that separate people yeah. on the basis of exclusionism. And you may say, well, we're addressing the, par the, the wrongs of the past, but we're 26, 27 years in now. Are you going to continue this in perpetuity? Are you going to say to a bright, bright young Indian boy, then sorry, um, your 82% your is not good enough to get you into medical school because uh, you know, of this, but the guy who you can, who's gonna take that place with four Cs is the son of a billionaire, black billionaire. It's a yeah. conundrum, isn't it? Yeah. So that, I'm that's, that's a kind way of putting it. It's, um, but you're right, it's the total injustice of that. It's saying, well, you yeah. wanna change the, the very fabric of society and make it fair, but in that pursuit, you've made it incredibly unequal. Because yeah, it's and furthermore, even more dangerously, you created a situation of freedom of speech will be rewarded with a violent reaction, either, you know, uh, of some kind, violent in, in the way of words even, yeah. violent in the way of a personal attack, uh, if that makes sense. I'm not saying yeah, physical yeah. violence, yeah. So you, you are violently um, responded towards uh, if you start speaking out. So people are not speaking out. I and mean, that is the problem. A democracy is not healthy when you, where everyone is so sensitive that everything is construed as racism or lacking empathy. You yeah. know, the other day the president spoke and he was fumbling with his mask, he had his mask over his eyes and it was kind of funny. It was, you know, he, 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 it was funny for a moment and he gave a great speech afterwards. And then people were you know, making jokes about his, his, his mask and other people were like, you should not make jokes about the president and you should not, you know. Jesus, have you lost your minds? Not yeah. your sense of humor, your minds. You know, you, you want to be offended about anything and everything for the sake of offense. It's not even about the offense. You want to be offended. Yeah. You're operating on the premise of offense. You're not operating on the premise of intelligence, the premise of a multifaceted human being of humor, wit, you know, um, a satire. You're operating, you offend me because you wish to be offended, actually. Anything. If I point my finger in the wrong direction, you think it's pointed at you. Yeah. So it's that kind of society we are living in. So a society that is lacking satire, lacking humor. It's a polarity, it's either you with us or you're against us. And this is my problem that I'm finding on a regular basis. This, this notion of, of that you, you talk about freedom of speech, but you will only, it only exists if I speak in your favor. Absolutely. So, you know, Mr. Malema, who we spoke about earlier, enjoys a great amount of freedom of speech and very little prosecution, because funny enough, they are scared of him. It's, it's, an, it's an unequal justice. Yeah. It's an unequal justice. Right now, I don't see Mr. Malema getting on a podium and questioning the, the, the ethnicity of the doctors and nurses and health workers, m many, many of whom are Indian, experts, including the scientists that are um, advising the president, asking and questioning their validity on race. Yeah. It is picking almost the arguments that you feel you're going to get the cheap and easy wins. But when you're doing that, it's yeah. a detriment towards the society in which you're supposed to be leading. And yeah. what the fear is, is that that's something that's taken its turn globally. You've seen it. We had a podcast recently with the former president of Guyana. And you look at the levels of corruption there. And it is identity politics that's being played mm. by one particular party. And you think, well, mm. there's... There's no justice there. There's no fairness. But we have mm. lost our fucking common sense. I suppose the best way mm. to put it is common sense is neither common nor does it have combined sense anymore. You know, it's, it's crazy. No, it's a, 
They should come up with another word like a gender sense, you know, because you have an agenda. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah, it's, it's about your agenda. And, you know, I've been trying to get my head around. I'm just going to digress a tiny bit about the internet. The internet is a, a drug. Mm. And the more you're on that drug, the more you buy into it. You mm. buy data, you, you're getting content. And the more content I can put out there and monetize, the more mm. money I make. So the internet is an access, but that access is a dual-edged sword because it is also somebody's making money of this in some way. The more Absolutely. I tune in, yeah. So it's not about truth. It's not about the better of society and all of that. It can be, but ultimately it's a money-making tool. And everyone who puts content on it is about bringing some kind of attention to it so that something will happen and look this is the way of the future but i'm trying to get my head around that i'm trying to see like people just putting inane stuff it's and then other people oh yeah so and so but said this but there's no validity in it but it's content someone put it there so that you can drive to that site another hit That's, on that site it's an interesting real but isn't that what you guys do with movies or with stage you produce content yeah. and people will ultimately have to pay. And on the movie sector, or even with mm. Mayfair, that's even larger as a production. Then not only except are you streaming I, yeah, with it. Yeah, I, I, think, I think you're right. I think, I think you're right. Except that with the internet, it's like every person on the planet has a stage and a cinema there. That's interesting, yeah. There's the difference. Mine is an art practice and a, Yours and a is space a craft. that you can... Absolutely. Yeah, that you can go to. But anyway, that's a bit of digression. Let's come back to what we are talking about. We're talking about, it's just, I mean, maybe I should talk about a little bit about achievements of, of, of Indian people in this country. Yeah, you know? absolutely. It's I think let's, let's, let's end on a positive note. Yeah. What, what have been the I biggest think, achievements? And are they, are they seen as, when Indian communities achieve something in South Africa, are they celebrated as South Africans then? Or are they almost still subdivided as being Indians? Well, I, w I don't see black people or white people going, hey, Mr. Rajesh Gopi, we love him. He, I don't see that very often. I mean, I, I'd like to speak about this guy, Mr. S uh, what is his name? Uh, some, the guy, he's, 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 a, he's a guy who, Indian guy who runs an organization called Gift of the Givers. Um, Gift of the Givers. He's an amazing, amazing guy. And he runs the most incredible charity. I mean, they really are an amazing charity. Uh, and they, you know, God knows how he does it, but they do it. And he's in everything. He's in, uh, helping in every way, every way. I mean, he um, is an incredible South African of, of Indian origin. Um, helping everyone, anywhere, anytime, you know. Then there are people who, who just, it's your everyday Joes who are going out there and doing amazing things in the field of education. Indian teachers have been incredible for this country in terms of the educational system. I'm not giving you names, but I know this. Mm. The, let's just take the Ramakrishna, for example. I, I, I go there sometimes and I know that like, they'll, they'll, they'll build a clinic and hand it over to the black community. They don't put their name on it, nothing. They just, they build a, 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 a technical center for training, build it and give it to the community. It's not making the newspapers. We're not writing about it, but this is going on. So yeah. when the likes of Malema start attacking Indians, he has never seen the big picture. He will, ref even if he does, he refuses to mention it because it refutes everything he is saying. Yeah. He could turn that around and say there has been historical uh, misconceptions about each other. And we invite Indian brothers and sisters to dialogue with us around this. But that would never work in his favor, would it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think what will be interesting is actually be able to get Mr. Julius on the show as well and having a look at that because this is a snapshot of our time right now yeah as mm. people of indian origin around the globe what is it that we're mm. going through 
how do we feel and mm. how do we start connecting the bridges to one another? Because mm-hmm. I think it's what we said right at the beginning of the show. This is a, a pilgrimage to the Holy Lands of India. I think mm-hmm. we're all going past that. It's more of a, well, let's actually discover more about these tentacles that we all share in common mm-hmm. and how mm-hmm. we've taken that and transported it. It's the idea that you said of this group, that they build the clinics and they hand it over that essence of social custodianship. And for some reason, we've done that all over the globe. But we, again, we yeah. haven't found the flames of publicity behind it to say, hey, great, look. And maybe because no. we have done that, people haven't recognized it. Like, to finish it mm. up, um, obviously, you're a, are you a, you're a celebrated South African actor, but are you only called South African when you're outside of South Africa and when you're in South Africa, are you just called the Indian geezer that's on TV? Yeah. yeah well, you know, that's, I, I don't mind that because that's how people talk. I mean, you know, like, oh, that black dude, he's really good looking. Oh, that black chick, she's, you know, she's got a really nice cheekbones. Um, that's how we are. Come on. We can't, you, you know, it's, it's disingenuous to say anything else. That's how we are. And then this is the thing. You know, you, you can't say, yeah, oh, why are you using the race? Because that's who they are and who I am. But yeah. as a, as a, when we are people working towards a national cause, a social cause, that, that's where, you know, we're working for the cause. The cause becomes bigger and it doesn't matter who we are in that. So this is not an either or. These are shades of many grays here. Yeah. Um, and um, coming back to successes, uh, you know, people listening and on the podcast, you should know wherever you are that, you know, Indian people contribute. Yeah, there are idiots everywhere. There are stupid people in every group and Indians are no better. And I trust me, I know a lot of stupid Indians here. Um, Absolutely. And they, many of them probably think I'm stupid, which is, you know, <laughs> good for God, which is fine. I can accept that. But... Um, I, I have seen so much good come out of our community to others. So much. I am, I don't even have the, I, 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 I exasperate at the energy that it takes for what they do for no reason other than charity and benevolence. Yeah. And that must be highlighted. They Absolutely. are at the forefront for 1.2 million. They, they punch way above their weight, bigger than, more than any, you know, some of the other bigger communities. They punch, punch, punch. And that makes me very proud coming from this background. And and, and it's something I take into my work and into my teaching. And something, you know, on the shoulders of my elders, my community elders, I stand tall. I think that's that's a powerful way to end the show. If if people wanted to see some of the plays, um, obviously they are around the globe. Is there any way that they can access these online? Is there any recordings ah, of these things? You know, uh, now that everybody's uh, online has become everyone's next best wife, um, <laughs> I am trying to find a way to upload it um, and attach some charity to it. Um, so that people at a minimal cost can watch some of my things and then of course benefit somebody. Um, so yes, there, there will be, I do a very famous show called Out of Bounds, which is about um, growing up in a joint family system in the 1980s. One person playing 28 characters and the show was seen by you know, all over the world, many places in the world, uh, including the late Mr. Great Nelson Mandela. Mandela, yeah, you performed it directly for him, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, performance, private performance, um, um, will be something I think everyone, everywhere would love to see. So I'm hoping that you, Rajan, and I can figure out a way, maybe either live or maybe a, a world tour again around the idea of diaspora Absolutely. and dialogue around it, um, associated with, with the work that you're doing in the podcast work. And this is really nice. I think that uh, coming back to what I was saying 20, you know, uh, in 2002 when I started working, this conversation is kind of tying back with that. Uh, you can turn away from your home, but your home never turns away from you. Um, <laughs> so it's, it feels like that. So, um, yeah, I think, it's, uh, it, I think the work, uh, um, if we're able to travel it or get it viewed, we would find a great deal of synergy in other people, maybe operating on amateur levels or professional levels, 
to kind of to, to work around it and, and lord knows what could come out of such a dialogue because what you're doing to me it seems that you people are working in isolation and even when i listen to your podcast on the guy the guyanese ex president president yeah he he said he thought he came from so and so and to place like this in india but he didn't go back um, and you can understand why, because they're so busy in where they are, but maybe with the work that you're doing can help people to, to revisit that in a, in a kind of an artistic way, in a kind of a cultural way. Absolutely. Um, because you don't have to go make a trip to Bihar or UP, but you can visit it through the, through the, the empathy and um, identification of art and, 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 and characterization. What a remarkable episode. I'm sure you agree. It's times like these that you really realize the privilege of being able to host, curate, and bring together these remarkable conversations. Speaking with Rajesh, as you would have heard, was vitally important because it gave us a second look into a country that many people thought they knew. I suppose given what's taking place in the U.S. right now, with the fight against injustice, it's important that we fan the flames of positive discussion on all injustice across the globe, so therefore together we can start making a difference. As promised, if you'd like to find out more about the Global Indian series, you can check us out on social media, on Instagram, at the Nazrans, or via Twitter, Global Indian Pod. There you can reach out, you can tell us your ideas, your stories, or countries that you feel that we should be looking into, and importantly, keep up to date with our latest podcast. As always, if you like these discussions, please do like, please do share, and please do comment. It makes a huge world of difference, because together we get to create a living encyclopedia on the world of the global Indian community. Until we speak, I hope all remains well, safe, and importantly, make sure that we all fight the good battle for eradicating injustice in the lives of ourselves and those around us. Bye for now.